when is the next class? <coughs> we'll see how we do today, and then we'll see how we do on Thursday. If I, I, I don't get through the, the kidney and stuff, then we'll push it back until Thursday, that following Thursday, right? Idea. I'm not going to – it's important, so I want to make sure I cover it. All right, watch. Watch. After you take the respiratory – kidney quiz I'm not going to cover it digestion there's a video on completely digesting a hamburger so I go through the uh, entire process of digestion you got me in one, video. in one video and then I have the functions of the pancreas gallbladder and uh, liver Make sure you watch that specifically because it's a little more detailed than what I go into in the digestion video. And then um, that's a week from Thursday. So that following Thursday, I'm doing looking at the dates. I'm going to get this screwed up for sure. Okay. All right. So tentatively, right, we're going to have the respiratory kidney quiz supposed to be on the 23rd. On Thursday, we'll find out where we sit. Okay, if it's not good, if I'm not done and I don't feel good about it, then we'll have it on the 25th. You got me? Now, August 1st, we're going to have that digestive, uh, digestion quiz, right? So you'll have a week to study that, those uh, videos. And then you have the final. That's it. So for the respiratory kidney quiz, we need to print out both of those take-homes and do both of those? Separate. Yes. Okay. You got me? And then um, uh, we'll take that quiz and then we'll have the digestion quiz and then we'll have the final. That's is it. The final cumulative from everything from the first or is it from the second half? Everything? It's the second half. Okay. So from respiratory okay. uh, on. Same setup as the midterm? Yep. Okay. Yep. So Tell me. So what I'll do is, this is what I normally do. I take the highest of the two take-home grades and use that as your 20%. You got it? Yeah? Okay. So we know where we're going, right? Yeah. Okay. Right. You, right? Now, if we don't get through it, then we'll have the respiratory kidney quiz on the, what did I say, the 20 what? 25th. Okay. Uh, you got me? And the final is just the, the normal test. We don't have anything with models, labels. No. Okay. No. We haven't looked at the model. That's an AMP general. Look, you know the parts. Well, we didn't really look at the models generally. <laughs> Who? In a, what, my class? Yeah. We yeah, you like did. You, you sat there and did nothing. You guys talked. I did not talk. Yeah, well, but take it with somebody else then if you think you got a bad deal. Yeah. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. Good, I'm recording that. That's on. Yeah, I like that. All right, here we go. All right, watch. Chronic bronchitis, watch. The number one cause of chronic bronchitis is cigarette smoking. And basically what happens is this. The lining of the bronchioles, that mucosal lining thickens, and goblet cells hypertrophy, so these people start making a ton of mucus. And what does smoking do to cilia? It paralyzes it. So they're making more mucus and they can't move it. So basically what happens is they get clogged airwaves. So, and this is important, normally with normal lung physiology, you only um, send blood flow to the alveoli that are uh, alveoli that are being ventilated, right? So if the alveoli is being ventilated, you're going to send blood to that alveoli. That makes sense, right? But in chronic bronchitis, you're not able to ventilate them, but you still perfuse them. You still send blood flow to them. So what happens in the alveoli or the and the bronchioles that are blocked? You can't remove CO2 and you can't get O2. So this blood and these pulmonary capillaries does not participate in gas exchange. 
Tell me you got that. So let's say this one's open, you're gonna be able to get rid of CO2 and take on some O2. But all of that blood that leaves the lungs and comes back to the left side of the heart, some of it did not participate in gas exchange. So what's gonna happen to the levels of PCO2 in arterial blood? It's gonna go up. What's gonna happen to levels of PO2 in arterial blood? It will go down. And what will happen to oxygen saturation? It will go down. Now, in normal physiology, we breathe indirectly due to the buildup of CO2 in arterial blood, right? But over time, what happens in people with chronic bronchitis is the medulla becomes desensitized to high levels of CO2. So the medulla is no longer the primary center for breathing. Over time, it gets desensitized, but you learned, and I'll never forget it, it was a Tuesday, that you have peripheral chemoreceptors, right? And those peripheral chemoreceptors respond to low PO2, high PCO2, but again, the high PCO2 really doesn't count because the medulla is desensitized to that, and drops in pH. Now watch. These peripheral chemoreceptors will detect that low PO2 in people with chronic bronchitis. You son of a... I'm getting my old computer back. Low PO2, and these peripheral chemoreceptors will detect that, and they will send nerve impulses back to the medulla. You another... You... <laughs> To the medulla and tell you to breathe. You got me? The peripheral chemoreceptors become the primary stimulus. For breathing, right? Now watch. Do you know what a refrigerator nurse is? Yeah. What is it? Someone that comes in and works overtime to get a refrigerator. That's right. They don't work full time as a nurse. They want a new refrigerator so they pick up a couple of shifts in the ER to get a refrigerator. I work with a refrigerator nurse. So she took care of a lady and she had chronic bronchitis, right? So what does she do? She's having a hard time breathing. She sits her up, puts her in a room and slaps her on like seven liters of oxygen. That's not my patient, I'm doing my own thing. But I look in her room and then all of a sudden I walk past it and she's like this. And she's breathing like three times a minute. And watch how smart I am, I go, that ain't right. <laughs> So I look at her chart, chronic bronchitis times 25 years, right? So I look at how much oxygen she was on, eight liters, seven liters, right? I turn it down to two, lo and behold, she wakes up and starts breathing. So people with chronic bronchi uh, bronchitis are hypoxic driven. Low oxygen is the stimulus for their breathing. If you give them too much oxygen, they no longer have a stimulus for breathing. Tell me you got that. That's chronic bronchitis, boom. So, wait. So it's different than normal physiology? Yes. So when they stop smoking, does it revert back or are they constantly in this thing? No, because uh, one of the problems, once the uh, goblet cells have hypertrophied, they remain hypertrophied, so they're constantly producing that mucus. And even if the, the cilia do start coming back to life, they get overwhelmed by that amount of mucus. So they still run into problems even after they stop smoking. What is that? Uh, increase in size. But don't goblet cells turn over? Oh, hypertrophy. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yes. Not sure why. Not sure why. For the rest of their life, they deal with that. So don't smoke. Go to Gateway. You got me. And there's a point at a point of no return with smoking, where no matter how, whether you quit or not, your lungs are not going to get better. They're just not. There's too much accumulated or you know cumulative damage. Absolutely. Yep. But if they keep smoking after that point, will that just shorten their life? Will yes. Longer if they stop still? 
Um, I, you, you know, I don't, I don't know. Go ahead and smoke all you want because you're going to die. You might as well die. <laughs> right, enjoy. You know? His stoma? Yeah. That was weirding me out, man. You know, it's like some people, there, just real quick, there's a condition called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. It's where people cannot make surfactant, so their alveoli collapse. And I was doing home care in Chicago, and I was taking care of a lady with a, so I'm taking her history and stuff like that, and she goes, will you excuse me? She's on oxygen. She took her oxygen off to go outside and smoke a cigarette. I went to this guy's house who smoked, and his walls were yellowed yeah. from the smoke. When, when I used to work at Pink and Save, you would get the guys with the, the mustaches. Yeah. You they smoked, they got tar on their uh, mustaches. Oh, my God. The yellow fingernails. That's all, that, ooh. Smoking's bad for you. You know what's better? No, read that textbook. <laughs> That's chronic bronchitis. Tell me you got that. All right. Here, I'm going to answer another question. You already know this. I feel foolish even going over it. Tell me to stop. Stop. Okay. How does increasing or de decreasing ventilation affect pH? It goes up and down. <laughs> up and down. I'm going to write that down. That's right. Why? Yeah, you're right. Okay. Well, good. That'll end that. Right? So watch. If you're hypoventilating, not breathing enough, you're retaining CO2 in the blood, right? So CO2 is going to go up, and it's going to force the equation to the right. Say, yeah. What's going to happen to your pH because you got more of these? So the pH drops, and that's a what? That's a respiratory acidosis. What's the only system that can compensate for a respiratory acidosis? Kidneys. The kidneys, and they compensate by? And how do they do that? By increasing bicarbonate, right? Very good. Okay, what's the opposite? Like you look on WebAdvisor and you thought you were gonna get a passing grade and then you oh. <laughs> so if your CO2 is low, which way is the equation gonna go? It's going to go to the left, and by carbon, it's going to grab those hydrogen ions, lock them up in carbonic acid, so you have less free-floating hydrogen ions, so that's a what? That's a respiratory alkalosis. That's very good. What's the treatment for respiratory alkalosis? Right. How do you do that? Yeah, I was told to put a bag over my head. <laughs> It's a paper bag, too, by the way, not a plastic, just so you know. <laughs> um, what they do now, I get, correct me if I'm wrong, they give them Valium, right? Yeah. yeah. Or just or top, first to top people down. Oh, yeah. That doesn't work, man. Right? So why don't they just do the bag? Uh, they get hypoxic, too, because uh, they're not uh, breathing a lot of oxygen, right? So. Can you just explain to me briefly how that works? If you're breathing into a bag, you're... You're rebreathing your CO2. There's very little CO2 in the atmosphere. So by breathing work. into a bag, you rebreathe your CO2 to get it back into your blood to lower your pH. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Do you ever play that pass out game? No. Yeah. <laughs> that explains a lot, Logan. <laughs> um, where you hyperventilate, and then what do they do? Squeeze you? Well, well what we didn't do is we didn't breathe hard and then just. Oh, cut off your carotids? Yeah. yeah. And then what would happen? What would happen? And then what, what was it for? When you're bored? I sleep over. Sweet. Oh, why don't you just sniff glue or something, right? <laughs> you ever do whippets? Yeah. You did? <laughs> I don't know. It's nitrous. 
nitrous oxide, <laughs> you know that nitrous is, um, it goes into the body unmetabolized and it exits the body. That's why there's no hangover with uh, nitrous. Shouldn't be telling you this stuff. <laughs> Go home. <laughs> there's a run on whippets. Buy all this stuff on Amazon. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Somebody explain to me what a whip is. You take the whipped cream and you don't fully push it. You don't know what, if you don't tip it upside down and you push the button, all the air comes out, yeah. then you inhale it real quick. What happens? You get, you high. get high. Yeah, that's, oh. yeah, the, the propellant's <laughs> nitrous oxide. Oh. Yeah. You get high. You know what I heard, too, that they're doing? Girls in high school are soaking their tampons in alcohol. Yeah. Doesn't that burn your stuff? I don't have that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I would think it would. Well, I would think that would burn. I thought they so were actually with them chasing their anus because it's faster there. Oh really? Oh maybe that was it. Oh, I'm way behind times, man. Not that I know that. Hmm. 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 Yeah. Oh, so it's or like you a taste of alcohol, yeah. like young people. Yeah, like they don't really want to get What is wrong with people? Yeah, really, what is wrong with people? It's no big deal. Yeah, don't do that. Yeah, it goes like right into your bloodstream. Go to Gateway. All right, here we go. Ready? I'm, I'm going to explain to you how carbon dioxide is transported in the blood. I want this whole thing. There will be questions on this. I'm telling you this right now. Ready? How is oxygen transported in the blood? Two ways. There you go. Dissolved in plasma, and it's measured as right, PO2. And then bound to hemoglobin, the iron on hemoglobin, that's measured as what? Oh, oxygen saturation, right? So when they do the little thingy thing, they're looking at um, oxygen saturation, right? Okay, here we go. So, watch. Where's PCO2 the highest? In the cell, right? Because through metabolism. What's the PCO2 of arterial blood? 40, right? The PCO2 inside the cell is 45. So. CO2 by pressure is going to move into the plasma until they're equal. Tell me you got that. So one of the ways that carbon dioxide is transported in the blood is dissolved in the plasma of the blood. The other way that carbon dioxide is transported in the blood is bound to the amino group on hemoglobin. It does not compete with oxygen to bind iron. It's bound in a different place. The amino group. Say yes. But the final way is this way, and I, I want you to understand this. CO2 from the plasma is going to diffuse into the red blood cell. And CO2 is going to combine with water and form our buddy, carbonic acid. And carbonic acid is going to dissociate into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions, right? If that hydrogen ion remains free floating, it's going to drop the pH inside that red blood cell. That's bad for you. So that hydrogen ion loosely binds to hemoglobin, so hemoglobin buffers that hydrogen ion. So hemoglobin is another, another chemical buffer. And you remember the law of electroneutrality? Bicarbonate has a negative charge and it's readily diffusible through the red blood cell membrane. So bicarbonate will diffuse into the plasma of the blood. Boom. And to maintain that law of electroneutrality, a chloride from the plasma enters the red blood cell. Are you with me? All of that blood then, now is venous blood, goes back to the right side of the heart. What's the PCO2 in the lungs? Just read it. We'll just say it's 40. What's the PCO2 of venous blood? So PO2, our PCO2 by pressure is going to leave and go into the alveoli. Tell me you got that. As the PCO2 begins to drop in the blood, the, uh, the bicarbonate from the plasma is going to come back into the red blood cell. Are you with me? 
To maintain that law of electron neutrality, the chloride shifts out. And because bicarbonate's a base, it's going to change the shape of hemoglobin and two things happen. The hydrogen ion that was loosely bound falls off. The hydrogen and bicarbonate come together to form carbonic acid and it's broken down to CO2 and water and the CO2 is expelled. At the same time, the, whoops, the same time, the bicarbonate comes in, the amino group changes shape, the hemoglobin changes shape, and that CO2 that was bound to the amino group can't hold on, and it goes from high to low. That's how carbon dioxide is transported in the blood. The vast majority of carbon dioxide is transported in the form of bicarbonate. Tell me you got that. Boom. And there's an enzyme, you should know this, called carbonic anhydrase. And it's found a ton of it in a red blood cell. And what that does is that speeds up the process of that chemical reaction of um, breaking down carbonic acid to CO2 and water so you can get rid of it. Tell me you got that. So if you have uh, altitude sickness, you're blowing off more CO2 than you're actually producing. So they give you a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. That's the drug that's used to treat altitude sickness. That's Diamox. Diamox. Very good. Altitude sickness? Yep. You get altitude sickness? Um, uh, Viagra works the same way in the lungs that it does in uh, the uh, private parts, yeah. right? It's an arterial vasodilator. So what happens is you, it dilates the pulmonary vessels, so you get more perfusion and more ventilation okay. without increasing your respiratory uh, drive. So that's how that works. That's why athletes take it too. Yeah. Because if they need it at their age, I mean, cut it out. <laughs> did I tell you I did the original clinical trials for Viagra? No. Mm -hmm. So do you know what a single blind study is? Yes. What is it? Only one side knew who got what. Right. You are not Right, I was the side that knew. Oh, you were? Yeah, the people didn't know. So they came in these little three-pack blue pills, right? And this is when me and my ex-wife weren't getting along. So I'm like, I'm gonna try it. And I'll never forget, it was a Sunday night, I'm watching Sunday Night Baseball with uh, Joe, Morgan. Joe Morgan and who's the other guy? Can't remember, but it was a while back. And uh, I'm watching the game, right? And I take it and then I'm like, it was like being in junior high again, man. I'm not even kidding. And it was like, holy cow. Then, and I'm like, this is totally going to waste right now. Anyways, the next, <laughs> the next day I wake up and my back and my sinuses are killing me. And I'm like, nah, I don't think so. It ain't worth it. You know what I mean? Unless like Sophia Vergara shows up at my doorstep, then maybe. You know. uh, yeah, it's a common side effect because it's an arterial vasodilator. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm like, I could not believe that. I'm like, I was like in junior high again. Like my kid, right? He was in junior high. Comes out of the bathroom. He's got this pissed off look on his face. I'm like, what's wrong with you, Dad? You know, for no reason, I'm just walking around and my dick gets hard. <laughs> and I said to him, <laughs> tell me when it don't, then you got a problem. <laughs> Otherwise, relax. I said, you'll see all the other guys walking down the hall like this, right? They got the same problem. They got no dick control. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Look, it happens, right? It's a natural thing. That's how CO2, how do we get on that? Um, 
That's how carbon dioxide is transported in the blood. Say, yeah. Okay. What else we got? What else we got? Come on. What else we got? No, I'm not doing the curve. I did. A, I got a video on that. And asthma, I got a video too. Yeah. Watch that. There can be questions on that. Okay. Um, let's see. I did this, right? I did number. Uh, I did number twelve. I did that. I last time I explained how carbon monoxide kills you, right? Guys. Uh, yes. Yep. Uh, pulmonary function. There's a video. I'll explain number seventeen. Number nine. I just. Uh, oh no. You can figure that one out though, right? The number nine. Right, I'll go over that real quick. Right, so watch. I'll go over it real, real quick. Number nine. Number nine. Okay, ready? I'm going over uh, increased ventilation and DKA. First of all, if your blood sugar is 1,100, what fuel is most readily available? That's very good. So if you can't get glucose into the liver because you ain't got no insulin, what does the liver think? Starving. You're starving, right? So the liver will take fat and convert it to what? The ketones, right? Beta hydroxybutyric acid, acetoacetic acid, and acetone, right? And what are you dumping into your blood? Acid. You're dumping acid. Why are you? Why is the liver making acid? What's the only fuel the brain can use? Glucose. And if you don't have glucose, the brain can use what? Ketones. That's why the liver makes the ketones. But the ketones are acidic. Yep. So what's going to happen to the pH of your blood? It's going to drop. And if your pH drops, that means you got more free-floating hydrogen ions. Say yes. So what's floating around your blood that can grab them? Bicarbonate will grab them. So which way will the equation go? What's that? Your bicarbonate is going to go down. So watch, watch. So when a metabolic acidosis, boom, 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 boom. That says water. Why can the brain use ketones for fuel? There's ketone receptors in brain. That's why uh, there's not a lot. There's upregulation once you start uh, living off ketones. That's why when people go on a ketogenic diet, the first week or so after they start burning ketones are kind of goofy and then the brain regulates itself and starts using ketones routinely That's the keto diet is no, like no sugar, sugar. No. right right how do you live like that is it bad to do that is, it bad? is that diet bad for you yeah because <laughs> god gave you a pancreas that secretes insulin for a reason No, because most people can't stand it that long. I mean, do you want to live like that? No. Right. So watch. In a metabolic acidosis, like in DKA, the hydrogen ions go up. What can grab them? Bicarbonate. So what's going to happen to the amount of circulating bicarbonate? It will go down. So the equation is going to go this way. So if this side goes down, what has to happen to CO2? It has to go down. And what controls CO2? The respiratory system. So you will increase your uh, rate of breathing. And that's that Kussmaul breathing in DKA. Say, yeah. Uh, boom. <coughs> Killing that. So putting them on oxygen, <coughs> corrects the Kussmaul breathing? Or is no, no. It gives them more oxygen? 
it just it it gives them more oxygen but that's really not their problem what their problem is is that they don't have insulin so if you give them insulin you'll start getting glucose into the liver the liver says hey i'm not starving anymore i'm not going to make these ketones they won't have the uh dumping the uh, acid into the blood so the respiratory system will slow down what was the question for number nine can you show me the question again explain in detail the reasons for increased ventilation oh okay. Patient with okay yeah why do they breathe more in DKA. Yeah. All right. That's that. So they just put them on, they just give them insulin? They give them, th yeah. They give them insulin and IV fluids and they slowly drop their blood sugar and the breathing will correct itself. Say so yeah. Okay. And then watch. Where are beta 2 receptors found? Lungs. Right. Beta-2 are found um, in the bronchioles. You got me? Watch. Indorol. Indorol is the first beta blocker. It was discovered, I think, yesterday. Indorol is a non cardio selective it blocks all beta receptors. What binds to beta 2 in the bronchioles? Epi. Epi. You got me? What does epinephrine do to your bronchioles? It dilates them, right? So if you give somebody Indorol, you're going to block beta 1 receptors in the heart, but you're also going to block beta 2 receptors in the bronchioles. And if they get an asthma attack, then that albuterol will not be able to bind there and they can die. That's why Indorol is contraindicated in people with asthma. Make sense? Boom. All right, hang on. Like that, okay. And I know I covered it in one, one of those videos, but I'll cover it real quick now. Hang on, hang on, I got you. Here we go. True or false? When you take a breath in, when you take a breath in, your alveoli expand. True or false? Good, I would say that. Watch. Your alveoli will expand. When you blow the breath out, what's the natural tendency of the alveoli? To collapse, right? And that's why when you're reading the textbook, you lick your finger before you turn the page because water makes things sticky. And because the walls of the alveoli, there's water in there, when they collapse, they, the water molecules will stick together and you can't reinflate those alveoli, right? Or it's very difficult to do it. So in the lining of the alveoli, there are specialized cells called type two alveolar cells and these cells secrete a substance called uh, surfactant and the function of surfactant is to prevent water molecules from sticking together so that when the person blows out the air the, alveoli, the alveolar walls don't stick together and then you can't reinflate them and you don't start making surfactant, the baby, until about the seventh month of gestation. That's why if babies are born before that, many of them go into respiratory distress and then have to be placed on a ventilator. And here's the thing, when um, a baby or an, even an adult is placed on a ventilator and the air is pushed in, instead of being pulled in by changing the uh, volume of the lungs, the alveoli don't produce surfactants. That's why when someone's on a ventilator, they want to get them off that ventilator as soon as they can. It's just not a good thing. Is that why they have to go through like therapy to get off yes. sometimes? Yes, yes. Now, if the, they know the baby's coming early, they can actually give the mother surfactant and uh, 
the baby will start s producing um, surfactant. And if they don't, which they typically don't, and the baby goes on the ventilator, they can put sur uh, synthetic surfactant down the ET tube, and the baby doesn't have to stay on it as long. So that's surfactant. What, do you know what the medical term is for when the alveoli collapse and stick together? It's a, it's a good word. Atelectasis. Yeah, atelectasis, atelectasis. Don't you that. think that would be a good name for a rock group? It's here for atelectasis. It would be. I know it would be. Electronon too, like that. Yeah, you're oh, you're employed? Don't you think that was a good one? I like that one better. That was the best one ever. Ridiculous. Yeah, I know, right? How many people got that? Okay, watch. Let me just show you this. Since you went over that pulmonary function thing and you uh, studied the, the terms, this is a person with emphysema. Um, basically, in emphysema, there's a destruction of the alveoli and the associated pulmonary capillaries. So these people basically have decreased surface area. And all this is basically anatomical and physiologic dead space within the thoracic cavity. It's basically useless trapped air in the lungs. So people over time, what will happen is their chest wall will actually get bigger. They'll get that barrel chest to accommodate that increase in dead space in their lungs. Now this is my uncle, and I know knew the guy all my life, right? And I never noticed this black rectangle on his eyes. <laughs> hmm. Why did he do that? You see the whole dead body anyways. Yeah, but the, the eyes are the windows to the soul. So that's why they, that's literally why they cover him? Yeah. So you don't know who that is, even though I know that's my uncle. I took the picture. Okay, wait, this is what I want to show you. Where is it? Oh, here we go. Look. These are normal lungs. These are people, this is emphysema. All that dead space, what it does is it pushes down on the diaphragm. So the amount of movement in the diaphragm is very, very small because it's already pushed down by that, that increased residual volume in the lungs. That's why people with emphysema, they breathe like this. because they can't contract that diaphragm very far. So they're referred to as pink puffers, right? And people with chronic bronchitis, a blue bloater, and I'll, uh, if you take my pathophysiology class, I'll explain why that actually happens. Tell me, uh, you got that, that's all dead space. Is that like a form of peeping? Is Pe it a form of peeping? It's when they do the purse of breathing? Yeah. Yes, oh. yes. Yes, and they need that because when they blow that air out, the, um, the bronchial walls, they also typically have bronchiectasis where the bronchial walls wobble, they're very weak, and then when they blow it out, they collapse it. So by personal breathing, that creates a little peep. They, they do, their yep. And then they breathe like this to take the weight of the chest off their lungs so they can breathe easier. That looks good. Yeah. So what would the ER do for somebody that's like crisis breathing like that? I've never seen a person whose stats are going way down now. They're breathing that first lift and that's going well. Uh, for those people, you can, uh, they, like they'll use BiPAP on them. So BiPAP is um, uh, PEEP and uh, uh, ins it's PEEP and expiratory, no, inspiratory, uh, inspiratory, I can't remember. It's pressure both ways. So as air, when they take a breath, the machine feels them taking a breath, can sense it, and it puts positive pressure to open up more alveoli. 
and then when they're blowing the breath out, the machine will put in a little positive and expiratory pressure to keep the LV alive from collapsing. But uh, they got to be doing halfway decent. They can't, you know, they got to be hemodynamically stable, right? They got to be coherent to understand it too. Otherwise, they take the mask off. And then th your last resort for them is intubating them, you know. But if you intubate someone with emphysema, they ain't getting off that ventilator. All right. See, tell me you got that. All right. Did I do that? Which which ones didn't I do? I did this, 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 this. This, 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 this. You're gonna watch that video. It's a good one. I did this, this, this. Tension pneumothorax. You know about that? What's the treatment? Needle decompression. Needle decompression followed by chest tube. chest tube to suction. Right, guys. Wait. Sam knows about that because he's a paramedic. Is everybody a paramedic here? Hmm? Who's a, who else is a paramedic? Are you a paramedic? We do go on the second or third intercostal or right Yep. You see it on Gray's Anatomy? Yeah. Yeah, you just shooting out of Didn't I show you uh didn't I show you that? I didn't show you? All right, here we go. Be real quick. You know why the terms are really good? Tension pneumothorax, like there's tension there. Cardiac tamponade. Oh, that's those are good words. I'm watching the show. I did one of those on a pig. We actually did a. A needle decompression on a pig. Oh, cardiac tamponade? Yeah. yeah. I did that on an 88-year-old lady. Never done it on a person. She ended up dying, though. But I gave her a few more hours. <laughs> that was nice of you. Yeah, it was. <laughs> then she looked at me. I wanted to die. Why did you do that to me? There's a lot of people she actually like that. that. No. <laughs> she was unconscious. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah. Okay, this is in Russian, so I'll I'll interpret. <laughs> right. So watch. There's the thoracic cavity inside the. Here's the needle going in. Now there's a catheter over that needle, right? A plastic catheter. You don't want to keep the sharp, tough strong metal needle in there because as the lung reinflates it will puncture the lung you don't want that so once you place the hole you pull the needle out and the catheter remains in place and that's flexible now in a tension pneumothorax basically what happens it's like a roach motel air gets in but it can't get out so when you take a breath in the distance between your rib cage, the, your ribs increases. So when you take a breath in, the hole that's in the chest is bigger. So air will get in. But when you blow the breath out, the distance between the ribs decreases so the air gets trapped. And every uh, breath you take, I'm watching you. You just got this? Thanks. I know that you guys are so young, it's just, it's just terrible. So uh, when you take a breath in, the air gets trapped. When you try to blow the breath out, right, you can't get that air out. So progressively what happens is the air inside the thoracic cavity begins to compress the lung. So what they do in an emergency situation is they do a needle decompression. They put a needle in the chest, pull it out, and then there's a one-way valve on that needle which will allow air out, but it won't allow air in. And then slowly that lung will begin to reinflate. And you can see it. Oh, wow. he, he, this dude was a smoker. Yeah. 
Yeah, this has got to be like. Uh, you said it's a long shot. So they do some weird shape right here, and then we'll get you. <laughs> well, in Russia, they could do a lot of things, man. And then once they get enough of the lung uh, reinflated, right, they close and then they'll put a chest tube in to suction. And they'll keep that in for a, th a few days. And then they'll take uh, chest x-rays to make sure that the lung is completely reinflated. And then once it is, they pull the chest tube out, cover it with little Vaseline gauze, and then the person ambulates home. Uh, just so you know that when a person gets a chest tube, especially in the, in the emergency room, they can't because they don't know what shape this person's in. They know that it's airway, breathing, circulation. So until they know exactly what's going on with this person, they can't um, uh, give them any pain medicine. So you're cutting and then you're sticking, and that tube, that's, that's a big tube. It ain't, you know, it ain't no little tiny tube. I told you about that when the two guys tried to shoot each other in the emergency room. I did. I know. I didn't tell you that. You know about this, Sam, right? It. I, I worked Friday, Saturday, Sunday, twelve-hour shifts at Parkland in third shift. So it was called the Knife and Gun Club. So two guys came in and they had shot each other. So we had what was called the eight bed surgical pit. It was like a pit and there were eight beds and then the trauma surgeons were there. So they wheel these guys in. I'm working on one guy and he's got a pneumothorax. He got shot in the chest and he's bleeding all over the place. So I got my finger in one of them and then I'm trying to help the surgeon put a chest tube in. And again, there's no anesthesia, right? So this guy, he's sitting up and he's trying to grab his, grab his boot. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on? The other guy in the other bed, they're working on him. I forget what was going on with him, but there was this big sheriff's deputy and the guy is grabbing for his boot and he grabs for his boot and he pulls out a gun. So I grab the gun and then the sheriff he sits there right there and boom, he blows a hole in that guy's chest. And I'm like, that just happened. I told him, I go, we are working on this guy. <laughs> and this is what he said in his southern draw. He goes, he posed a threat to you, sir. <laughs> I'll never forget it. He just shot him. And that was in the, a room, and when that gun goes off, I'm like, damn, I couldn't hear for a while. It was, it was incredible. But he, apparently he was trying to get the gun out of his boot to shoot the other guy. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I had piece of, pieces of chest. Uh, I'm, I mean... The, I don't know what even what kind of gun it was a it was a revolver and it was like a big freaking gun and I'm like I couldn't believe it then we used to get held up routinely so guy would walk in there was no metal detectors back then guy would walk in with a gun put a gun to my head give me all your drugs I'm like yes sir gave him all the drugs then uh, just real quick one time I was doing triage right so <laughs> this lady comes in and she's kind of being helped in by two younger guys and I'm like what happened her boyfriend beat her up I go where were you well, we weren't home I said bring her on back and then we had these exam rooms and they just had curtains so you just pull the curtain and I'm asking her questions you know cleaning her up getting x-rays and stuff I go what happened oh my boyfriend came home and he was drunk and he beat me okay so anyways, the curtain opens up and there's this guy and I go, who are you? I'm the boyfriend. And I went, bam. <laughs> and in real life, if you hit somebody good, they don't get up from that. And you know what dead weight sounds like? And it hit, it's hitting this floor. And I'm, the cop was there too. And I'm like, I just lost my license, didn't I? He goes, he slipped. <laughs> they had a, the cholera 
they had to get a CT of his brain. I'm like. You know, look, watch, 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 watch. I'm Irish, right? I'm Irish Catholic. I've been in a lot of fights, <laughs> right? We drink and we fight. But here's the thing. When you stand up to a guy, right, who's as big as you, you don't know if you're going to get your ass kicked. But most, any man, most of the time, can beat up any woman. It doesn't really take a lot of courage to do that. It takes courage to stand up to a dude as big as you because you might get your ass kicked which I did on occasion. <laughs> Me and my buddy <laughs> were in the midnight hour. <laughs> he would always want to get in fights, right? So he'd go, look, that guy's giving me manly looks. And I'm like, come on. And he goes, let's get in a fight. I'm like, God. So he, gets, he picks a fight with guy, and of course his buddy jumps in, so I got to jump in. And then this guy looks at me and goes, I ain't never lost a fight. And I go, well, I have. <laughs> I fight better when I'm drunk. <laughs> right? Because, like, when you're, like, when you're not drunk, it's like, I could get hurt. Now? When you're drunk, you don't feel it. Yeah, and what, like, now, I, th I think about that stuff. I'm like, damn. I mean, it got rough. Like, beer bottles and the whole, I'm like, I got cut by one right here. The scar's still there. I'm like, that's just stupid. Now I run, because I could get hurt. <laughs> Plus I can't see, it's just a mess. All right, that's tension pneumothorax, see, yeah. Yeah, you wanna, you wanna get some experience, you work in a county ER, like in a big city. Dallas, right, Parkland, it was a mess. Right? Guy came in, got shot. Did, I told you this, right? The trauma surgeon, Tim, you ever massage a heart? I go, yeah. You know, every Tuesday I go to the heart massage club. Right? He goes, I'm going to crack his rib. Get on top of him and put your hand in there. You can feel his heart. Get a glove on. We got to wheel this guy to surgery. So I'm on top of him with my hand on his chest, massaging his heart, wheeling him to surgery. That guy lived. I could not believe it. They send the Navy medics down to Chicago for training before they send them overseas to work with them. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. That's insane. Mm hmm And they say because it mimics the trauma that they're going to see in Iraq and Afghanistan, they see in Chicago. Yep. Yep. The stuff I saw, man, I told you about the lady that her husband ran her over with a car. He ran her over with a car, and then he thought her, he missed her, but her hair got caught underneath the drive shaft. So he rolled over her again. And she came in, she was conscious, and she's spewing obscenities, right? Hair was ripped out. And I said to the ER doc, I go, I think she's got brains coming out of her ears. And she did, right? Anyways, take her to the ICU. She was in the hospital for about six months. And then I hear this lady getting wheel out of mother, just obscenities, right? And I'm like, all I could was imagine her husband in that truck just revving the engine, just wait <laughs> again. <laughs> then I had this wait, one girl. So she had brains coming out of her ear and she still lives? Yep. I don't know. Possibility? Don't even know. But there was a little piece, like fluid coming out, cerebral spinal fluid, and it looked like brain tissue. It looked like uh, it was a little gray. And Did she have like large deficits? I don't know. I didn't talk to the lady, and all she was doing was swearing. Maybe that was her deficit. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, this guy, uh, this motorcycle accident came in. And this girl came in, I remember her first name, it was Brandy. She was 18 years old, and she was physically perfect. I never saw a more physically perfect woman in my life. She was 18, and she was dead. She had no helmet, they were, uh, he was drunk, and she had a closed head injury. Not a scratch on her, and she was just dead. Then when he found out he was, she was dead, he takes his head 
and he pounds it into the into the wall. He broke his leg. <laughs> That's nuts. But yeah, those are good times. Then one time a guy comes in trying to commit suicide, taking Tylenol. So the doctor I worked with, his name was Tragus, and he wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer. He's a nice guy. But he's trying to intubate him. And <laughs> the guy is beating him up. And I go, if he can beat you up, he can breathe on his own. <laughs> well, that's a good point. He had a real <laughs> thick southern drawl. <laughs> and every time a woman came into the ER, every time, regardless of what she came in for, he always did a pregnancy test. <laughs> Yeah, he uh, he did a uh, a pelvic on a ninety-one-year-old. Why? I don't know. Lady came in; she had lymphoma. He's trying to put a central line in her. I said, "She has lymphoma." I want to see if I got it in. So he goes, get a chest x-ray. I go, she's dead. We do chest x-rays on dead people. Oh, I want to see if I got it in. What? I go, I'm not doing that. Yeah. <sighs> Can you believe that stuff? He would play, yeah, I know. He would, um, he would, uh, uh, that, there, there was some weird freaking people, man. I don't do that stuff. I just read the textbook. Did they, uh, was that a burp? <laughs> was it? Way to call me out. Why are you so surprised? <laughs> <laughs> just heard something like, damn, that was a good, was that you? Yeah. Wow. That was from the diaphragm, sister. <laughs> Okay, so that's respiratory, guys. Guys? Okay, uh, let's do this. Let's take a little break, and then we're going to go. Uh, we're going to start the, the kidney. The kidney, people don't like the kidney. I don't like the kidney. Why? I don't know. I just had a hard time remembering it. Do you remember anything <laughs> about the kidney? Uh, not, no. not at all? Do you have any exam? No, I don't. Uh, yeah, you got, uh, I made it out of 38, so you got a 39. Okay. So you did good. I have questions for you on it, though. I don't remember exactly what they are. When I get it back, I'll look at it. So that I uh, there are no questions. So I know what <laughs> Question time is over. Okay. I wonder where Patrick is. I'm kind of worried about him. How do you work? Did you say you had a video on him? Oh, so I know what that means. What? She's making her way, right? She's making her move. She's she leaving leave? now. Oh, no, she's not leaving. She's You're not going to leave? leave? That's okay. No, I don't take attendance. I know, but I don't have to take anybody to the doctor's appointment. Really? What if I had to go to the doctor? Would you take me? Yeah, For real? Yeah. Hmm, I'd never ask. My dad tried to walk home from work yesterday. How old is he? 62 or 3. Where does he work? He works at Insincrator. It's not even a far walk. I just don't like walking out at night by himself. Oh, he works second shift? Yeah. He was yesterday, wasn't it? I did not leave the house after I got done with my class. And I'll be honest, I'm going to publicly apologize to them tomorrow. I was such a prick yesterday. My, I, my head was killing me. If I would have had a drill, I would have drilled a hole right here. I swear to you, it was awful. Yeah. What?
Yeah. So it, it could cause that? Yep. Because the definitions are so similar when you read them. It's a collapsed lung, but atelectasis. Atelectasis really is collapsed alveoli. In the plural space, right. Okay. Right. So I was listening to this podcast, and this lady, when she was in um, med school, they had to do like a capstone like research project or something like that. And she thought it was weird that they, during their like rotations, they would do, they would teach them how to do pelvic exams on patients in surgery while they were unconscious. Um, they like it was like a normal like this is just like what happens all the time like at the end of the surgery they're like well here go ahead and try to do like a public exam on this patient to like teach them and they don't do like consents for that for the patient like the patients going in don't they don't have to sign anything saying like yeah that's fine like if you do that and people got like really upset with her for like making it even a thing at all they're like this is just the way we've done it forever and ever but she was like well shouldn't shouldn't patients be able to say yes or no if i want you to practice a pelvic exam on me while i am unconscious during surgery and who would say yes to that well i guess in the context of like we're like this is a teaching hospital and we're trying i didn't to even i did not know that i did um, not know that like maybe you would say yeah sure like what am i going to know i'm like i'm not going to feel it anyway they probably should do that anyways. Right. Right? I wouldn't well, want to be yeah, conscious should, for that. And I don't know if they were trying to argue that, like, maybe it's under the general consent you sign if there's going to be a doctor that's learning in the room. Maybe they have them sign some. But I don't even know if they do that, like, if there's someone. Wow, I, I didn't know that. I feel like they just verbally ask you, like, are you okay if this, like, student is in here? But, um, and, and, like, it, it was, like, a lot of, like, she came up against, like, a lot of, like, pressure to not do the project and to not even, because they didn't want it to change because they're like, well, it's the easiest way to teach a pelvic exam, so we don't want to do it any differently, which I understand that, but also it's like, why Why would it be, and they don't want people to say no, and that's why they yeah, right. want because they want to be able to keep doing it, but. Um, wow, I didn't, I, I did not know that. I am not, I never did it before. Wow. And I don't know if it's only for certain, sur like if they're going to do like a, like they're specifically doing surgery on women on their like reproductive system or something, and that's when they do it. It's not like they're coming in for heart like, surgery. Me and they're just going to do a pelvic Yeah. Thing, oh, I see. I see. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. It's like the doctor was going to do it anyway. The actual like surgeon is going to do it anyway. And then they have the student do another one right after that. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, my girl, she works for a plastic surgeon. And he, uh, the surgeon says, look, uh, this is a teaching hospital. So a resident may be doing part of your surgery. Are you okay with that? And, uh, you know, he supervises it and stuff, but, uh, yeah, they, they do that all the time. Right. Yeah, I don't think, I mean, you know, if they're doing, if somebody's having their gallbladder out and they're doing a pelvic on her, you know, okay, may, you know, I got to draw the line there maybe. But if they're having something like reproductive, yeah, yeah I mean, you know, they got to learn. They got to learn. And those mannequins and stuff, they're not, that's not real. You ever do, if you've ever done CPR on a real person, when you do it on a, compared to a mannequin, it's completely different. It's completely different. And if you do CPR right, you hear like little buttons, like a jeans popping, right? And that's the ribs cracking, not cracking, but the little costal cartilage on the sternum popping. And if you're going to compress that chest correctly, you got to pop some cartilage. Because you got to, I mean, you got to compress that chest, you know, two and a half, three inches to do a good compression. So that's what I mean. It's like the only way to get experience is to get experience. That's it. I mean,
Well, you spent 10 hours on one of the two tasks. And then okay, well, I didn't know if there was a respiratory, I thought the respiratory quiz was like an actual quiz in the room in class, not yeah. a study guide. Oh, yeah. Okay. What do you mean? What do you mean on your own? Well, you said we're watching the videos on our own. You're watching the digestion video. That's it. Okay. That's it. And, and do you understand? Okay, no. so, so this test coming up is going to be the respiratory and the kidney. What about the urinary? Well, urinary. Okay. Yes. Okay. And then the following? It's up on the thing. It says urinary and then kidney. So it, oh, it is? Sections, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, okay, that's... So it's, it's all it, yep, yep. Mind, don't, so don't. a week from that on August 1st is just digestive. Just digestion. That's it. And then we have one more class following that, and then the last class is on the third. We only have one, one more class? We only have six more classes. All together. We're just yeah. trying to figure out the timeline of tests, because if we did one on the 25th, one on the 1st, We'd have one on the third. Wait, I thought you said the next, the 10th or the day you wanted the digestion. Wait a minute, wait a minute. No, 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 guys, look, look, look. And I'm recording this. <laughs> <laughs> we only have three classes after digestive. Okay, watch, watch, watch. So today's the 16th, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay, so we've got today and Thursday, we'll finish up the kidney on Thursday. You got me? And then we'll have the test on Tuesday. So the 23rd is the test. Yeah, we should Yeah, we should get there, right? Okay. That should be, and then, what did I say? The first. The, f the okay. first will be digestion, okay. right? I'm not going to cover that. You're going to watch that video. Okay, we're going over the lymphatic and immune system. Okay. You got me? So then that test will be? Lymphatic and immune. Is That's everything? on the final. Everything after digestion. Everything after digestion is on the final. Oh, okay. So we're not going to have a separate you test? No. Okay. No. Tell me you got that. We no. This no. This no. Is the lymphatic immune going to be like all the other tests? Yep. Say yeah. So the final, is that going to include respiratory, no. kidneys, digestive also? 
Oh. Yep. Respiratory, kidney, digestion, all the way through. Okay. On the final. And that'll be the last Thursday. It'll be the last Thursday of the class. Which is the fifteenth. Which is the fifteenth. Are you sure? Well, we'll find out. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It'll be okay. Trust me. Right? Yeah. Look, 70% of you sitting in this room are going to die from cancer, metabolic disease, cardiovascular disease, or respiratory disease. Those are the things that you have to know the best when you first get out into the field as a nurse because those are the things you're going to see the most. Right? And then as you matriculate through your career, you learn more of the less common things. Right? So those are the things that you have to know most. And to get through nursing school, you got to know pH, right, and fluid and electrolytes and stuff, because that's what stops people from getting. So it's the last day of class is on the 13th. Last day of class. Okay. Then we'll have the final on the 13th. Relax, it's going to be okay. You got me? Don't worry about it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yep. Yep. You got me? Mm -hmm. And then in between, we're going to start the, we're going to be doing the lymphatic and the, the urinary system. All of that, our lymphatic and nervous system, and all of that stuff will be on the final. So the last class, last test you will take that counts as a quiz is that digestive quiz. And, okay, got it. You got me? Okay, here we go. The kidneys. People don't like them. How many people like the kidneys? The kidneys are like the stepchild of the body. Nobody talks about it until they do something wrong, right? So here we go. Why you got two kidneys? Well, why ain't you got two hearts? I wish that was the case. Yeah, but you can do fine with one kidney. Both sides of the so the right kidney filters the right side. <laughs> 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 uh, students in my general class, they go, Tim, our, when they were looking at the vein and artery guy, are veins on just one side of the body? Uh -huh. I could see why they would say that. Uh, okay, yeah, that was fair. But then I told them that when people have heart surgery, they put... Uh, metal hinges on parts of the heart so if they have to operate on it it's easier so to get at it door. <laughs> <laughs> they believe that okay watch watch we are symmetrical we are symmetrical right lateral we have two of everything medial we have one of everything that's why Was it? Never thought of that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, me. That's why I work at Gateway. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Not well. You ain't going to leave tall buildings, but you can hang on. All right? Okay. All right. Okay. Watch. Why is the, why is the right kidney lower than the left? First of all, before you answer that question, is this a male or female? Right. So why? The uterus. The uterus. Which question are you asking? Why? Why is the right kidney lower, lower than the left? Is it because the right there? Because the woman No, the woman who was modeling for this had an attitude. She's like. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's so bad. <laughs> right, why did you? Just wasted your life. Uh, that's because the liver's there. Now, watch. You got one liver, but here's the thing. We'll learn about that when you watch the digestion. The liver is the only organ in the body that, that can regenerate itself. So you can actually donate part of your liver. And here's the cool part. If you donate part of your liver, let's say to a child, the liver will grow to accommodate that space. But if you destroy about 70% of your liver, it's over for you. You need a liver transplant, right? Okay, so two kidneys, and you, you need to get this. What's the primary function of the kidneys? Filtration. Right, what do they filter? Waste. Right, but what, what, what do they actually filter to get rid of the waste? Yeah, they filter blood, right? But they really filter the, the plasma of the blood, right? The watery part of blood. The formed elements, red blood cells, white blood cells, albumin, should never be found in urine. If you have red blood cells, white blood cells, or albumin in your urine, that's abnormal. Tell me you got that. So the plasma of the blood is actually filtered. And one of the big functions of the kidney is to remove um, metabolic waste. Now, watch, and you remember this, I'll never forget it. Where does everything that you eat that gets digested and absorbed go to first? The liver. The liver. And when you eat protein, protein, those amino acids that are not used to make uh, protein go to the liver and that's right that amino group that's on the amino acid is hacked off converted to what what's it converted to oh well, first ammonia and then the liver converts it to urea and dumps it into the blood so blood urea nitrogen really is made up of uh, two compounds, really a little bit of ammonia and mostly urea. And you can't breathe those things out, so they have to be filtered out of the blood via the kidney. So one of the indicators of kidney function is blood urea nitrogen. Now, skeletal muscle, which we learned about a little bit, skeletal muscle stores ATP and it stores it in the form of creatine phosphate. That's why guys like bodybuilders like me, for the crowd, take uh, creatine. So when creatine is metabolized, it's metabolized to that waste product creatinine, and then it's dumped into the blood and filtered out via the kidney. So the two waste products that the kidney has to get rid of, really three, are blood urea nitrogen and creatinine. And blood urea nitrogen and uh, includes urea and small amounts of ammonia. Which one is the best indicator of kidney function? Creatinine. Why? Because muscle doesn't change a lot. That's right. So the amount of creatinine that you produce each day is going to be relatively stable because your muscle mass doesn't change that much. What determines blood urea nitrogen? Protein That's right, protein intake. So in people with liver failure, do you want them taking a lot of protein in? No, because they can't convert the ammonia to urea fast enough. The ammonia builds up in the blood and they develop hepatic encephalopathy. Yeah, you don't want that. You want to go to Gateway. Tell me you're with me. You got that. All right. So that's a big function of the kidney and you better know how you get that metabolic waste. Who would have a higher creatinine level normally, a woman or a man? A man because they have more muscle most yeah okay metabolic waste the other thing that the kidney does you better know this is it maintains long-term pH and it does that by controlling levels of what bicarbonate so the kidneys control bicarbonate more on that in a little bit all right the other thing it does is it maintains long-term long temp, long term, term uh, blood pressure. 
and it controls long-term blood pressure in basically three ways. Number one, we know about, right? Uh, pressure diuresis, right? We know about that. That's purely mechanical. Number two is through the, whoops, through the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And number three, you son of a, um, through ADH and the other hormone, ANP, more on that later. So that's how it maintains long-term blood pressure. And I'm gonna explain how that works. Now, watch, write this down, this is important. And it, th this, this holds true for um, literally um, every organ in the body. Again, when an organ fails, all the functions of that organ fail, right? And the functions that go first are the functions that require energy. You got me? So, just so you know, it takes energy in the kidney, takes ATP to get rid of potassium, hydrogen ions, and creatinine. All right, it takes energy to get rid of these guys. And the first thing to start going, the first problem that an organ has when it starts failing is the ones that require energy. So in people with kidney disease, kidney failure, they are hyperkalemic, they have a metabolic acidosis, and their creatinine levels are climbing. You got me? All right, the other thing that the kidney does since we're on it is that it maintains um, electrolyte balance. And I'll show you how that works too. And since we're there, it also maintains fluid balance too, fluid and electrolyte balance. Boom. The other thing that the kidney does, very important, is it activates vitamin D. What's vitamin D required for? Right, you need vitamin D to uh, absorb calcium from the gut. Alright. So it activates it. Vitamin D begins its synthesis in the skin. It's further synthesized, you know, changed in the liver, and then it's ultimately activated um, by the kidney, right? And then the other big function is, and since we are on it, whoops, the kidney monitors oxygen saturation of red blood cells. And if the kidney notes that there is a drop in O2 saturation, the kidney releases a hormone called erythro, son of a, erythropoietin. Erith, red, red blood cell. Poetin is not eating well. How you eating? Poetin. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, poetin means the form. So erythropoietin is a hormone that's released by the kidney in response to a drop in oxygen saturation. That hormone will then stimulate the bone marrow to begin the production of red blood cells. So, watch, watch. When an organ fails, all the functions of those organs fail. So if a person is in kidney failure, they're gonna have problems with blood pressure and fluid issues. Can they have as much water to drink as they want? 
No. So also they're going to have problems with metabolic acidosis and hyperkalemia. So people who are on dialysis will actually take uh, bicarb tablets to reduce the acidity of their blood because their kidneys are failing. And are they going to have a lot of red blood cells or will they be anemic? They'll be anemic because they're not releasing erythropoietin. And because they, don't, they can't activate vitamin D, they will also develop osteoporosis. Because w if you can't absorb the calcium, you've got to maintain that blood level of calcium and you will get it from the bone. Tell me you got that. All right, so again, if you understand the functions of an organ, then you will understand what happens if you don't have it. Okay, oh, one, one last thing. The kidneys also store glycogen. So not a, not a ton of it like the liver, but the, it does store enough. So they can have problems with hypoglycemia, people who are kidney failure. All right, a couple of terms you got to know for sure, okay? Now watch, absorption, absorption occurs in the GI tract. You eat some Skittles, it gets broken down to glucose, you absorb it into the blood. Tell me you got that. Watch, write this down. Reabsorption means it was in the blood, in the blood, got filtered out of the blood, and then brought back into the blood. That's reabsorption. You with me? Filtration is just that. Plasma is filtered. The filtrate is what was go what went through filtration, what's left over. And that's again, that's gonna be plasma when you talk about the kidney. Now, watch. Some things cannot be filtered in the kidney. Stuff that the body has to get rid of cannot be filtered. I ain't gonna go into why. So if it cannot be filtered but it's gotta got, be gotten rid of, it has to be secreted. So secretion in the kidney occurs from the blood, 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 you, blood, to the urine. So you take stuff that you can't get filtered, but you need to get rid of it, and you take that in the blood, and then you put it into urine. So filtrate is like a, say a coffee machine. Filtrate be the coffee at the end. Yes. The yes. Counts. No. It's the coffee at the end. That's the filtrate. Okay. So fil filtration is the process of filtering the plasma in the kidney, and what's left over is the filtrate. So that's a good analogy. So during secretion, how does, how does it know to like just get rid of one part of the blood? Does it not just like get rid of other stuff too, along with? Stuff that, y like, your kidney works like you clean a closet, right? How does a normal person clean a closet? They take everything out and then they clean it up and then the stuff that they want, they put back in. So when you filter the plasma, almost all of the plasma is filtered. Some things just cannot be filtered so they have to be actively secreted. So there's sites 
within the kidney and specifically the nephron that will actively secrete that stuff into the urine. So it pulls out the specific stuff? It does. It, it does. Brain. And I'll show you how that works, right? On a, and, and again, on a basic, on a very basic level. Tell me you got that. Okay. Here we go. How much blood do you pump each minute if you're an average adult? Right. So if I see a Woodman's or a Costco or something like that, and I say, hey, how's it going? You can say, I'm pumping five liters. I saw a girl one time at the store. I go, hey, how's it going? Secreting. <laughs> like, nice. Okay. Watch. If you pump five liters of blood each minute, approximately 20% of that blood is going through the kidneys at rest. What's 20% of five? I did it because the math is easy. Okay, well, maybe it wasn't. It should be one liter. <laughs> so one liter per minute, you son of a... Why does it keep doing that? I don't know. Irritating me. Look at this. Oh, it's because it's a picture dragged onto a slide. Who cares? <coughs> One liter. <laughs> you do. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> One liter per minute is going to the kidneys. I quit. You know, my old computer didn't do this because you could look, because I write retarded because I'm left handed. It interprets my hand and then it won't interpret the pen. So, okay, I'm gonna get this. I'm gonna practice tonight. I'm really not. Make you feel like I'm doing something. Okay, here we go, ready? One liter per minute is being uh, filtered by the kidneys. How many minutes are there in an hour? I'm writing that down. So 60 liters per hour, per hour in the kidney. And then 24 hours in a day, Tuesday, Thursday, feels like 36. You got me? So on average, 1,440 liters of blood go through both kidneys each day. Do you pee 1,440 liters per day? No. So watch, even though 1,440 liters of blood was filtered by both kidneys, 99% of what was filtered gets reabsorbed back into the blood. So on average, you make about 1 to 1.5 liters of urine per day. Per day, oh. And on the weekends, it's a little more. Because you have some daddy pops. That makes you pee. <laughs> Tell me you got that. Guys? So, even though you're sending a lot of blood flow through the kidneys, most of what is filtered gets reabsorbed. Tell me you got that. Okay, here we go. Watch. You learn this in uh, general, so I'm going to go over this um, fairly quickly. Watch. The kidney is broken into three anatomical parts if you look at a cro the cross section of the kidney. Number one, you have the outer part. What's the outer part of any organ called? Cortex. The cortex. Then you have the medulla, and the medulla is made up of these renal pyramids. And then you have this area here called the renal pelvis, right? Or the calyx, right? Major calyx. This is where um, the urine meets, right? So I like to call it the urine's commons area. They meet and talk about their day. Hey, how are you doing? Well, I'm a little pissed off today. <laughs> That's so bad. <laughs> I know, I hate me too. Look. Okay, watch. Once the urine is formed, 
it drains through these hollow muscular tubes called ureters. Tell me you got that. Does the urine just slide down the tube like a little slip and slide? How does it get to the bladder? Yeah, what? Mm. How does a uh, how does a tootsie roll get from your mouth to your stomach? Peristalsis. Peristalsis. So you have the smooth muscle within the ureter peristaltically waves the urine into the bladder. So the little tubes have muscles around them? Right. They're made of muscle, smooth muscle. So as the urine comes in, it will rhythmically contract and propel that urine into the bladder. Now that's a good thing, right? Because if it was just a slip and slide, if you stand on your head, that urine can back up into the kidney. You don't want that. Now look, the two ureters come into the side and they actually almost kind of go underneath right the bladder so here are the openings to the ureters and then they drain the urine so the urine kind of bubbles up into the bladder right now watch this is important just like the cervix you have baroreceptors in your bladder bladder by definition a hollow muscular organ so as the urine notice I made it yellow as it's filling up your bladder, the pressure increases, and that will signal baroreceptors, and that will reflexively send an impulse to say, ooh, I got to go. Tell me you got that. Now watch. You have two sphincters. You have an internal urethral sphincter that's under autonomic control. So when your bladder hits a certain pressure, like, got to go, and it will relax but you tighten up your external sphincter so you don't pee whenever. You know, kids, they don't know they can control that. Pee all over the place. <laughs> now watch, uh, pregnancy, because the baby's resting on top of the bladder, or as you age, that, that external sphincter weakens so people will get stress incontinence. They sneeze or they cough and they piddle their drawers. So they wear the pants. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, tell me you got that. Okay. So, um, watch. I think I told you this. If somebody has a spinal cord injury, they're a uh, quadriplegic or a paraplegic. Can they relax their inter their external sphincter? No. No. So a paraplegic has to self cath themselves every couple hours, and a quadriplegic has to have a fully catheter indwelling. Tell, tell me you got that. Why is it different for... Because they can still use their arms, so they can oh. do it themselves. So, okay, got it. Right, quad. Did I tell you the story about the guy? No. When I was uh, going to graduate school, I was doing home care, and I was taking care of a quadriplegic. He was 32 years old, and he jumped headfirst into a, uh, like a stream, and it was shallow, and he um, broke his neck. Uh, it was... Uh, uh, T, T1. So was he on a ventilator? Right, right. So was he on a ventilator? No. no, he wasn't, right? So anything below typically C5, then um, you're not on a ventilator. So every month I would have to change his catheter. So he would ask me, Tim, can you take out the catheter and come back in an hour and put the new one in. And I'm like, absolutely, absolutely. He, he never had a guy as a nurse. All the other female nurse, no. That's too great a risk of infection. So I'm like, and I don't want to know. I'm coming back in an hour. Right. <laughs> right. So he must have had some deal with the aid, right? Oh. But watch, watch. This is what you got to remember. And I, I never forgot it. He was a 32-year-old man. Mentally, he was all there, right? But physically, he was in a basically a useless body. 
So when I came back, he had a smile on his face and he was sleeping. <laughs> Looked like he had a hamburger too, I don't know. <laughs> <A cigarette. laughs> but, um, but, but do you understand what I'm trying to say to you? Like mentally that guy is 32 years old and they wouldn't do it for him. Like how could you not? Like, to me, that was my first thought. Well, maybe because they're females, understand. they don't understand. Because I didn't understand what you're talking about until, like, the last two minutes. I like, understand the reasoning he had behind asking. I, I it really is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> oh, you didn't know what he wanted? No, it took me like a while, oh. because that's not something I had to deal with. Well, they were probably like, why? Yeah, and so, and like, 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 he probably like, you would ask that, like, I knew immediately. <laughs> because you're a man. Right. <laughs> but because we're women, that's not a thought that goes through our head. How do you how do you guys live like that? Can I tell you something? Like I'm surprised I got through college. I actually am. Well, no, but I mean, like, like all I thought about was women, right? And I'm like, how did I learn this stuff? Right? That's all guys think about. Look, look mentally when you write. Oh, do you okay. understand? Okay, I got it now. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, wait. Did you feel it? No. But, but when, you, when you. Right, you want. Right. You and then you want to go to sleep. <laughs> you feel bad. Right. And then you go to sleep. Right. And then you go to sleep. You feel better here. I don't know. Look, I was trying to help a brother out. <laughs> right? And I would hope someone would do that for me. Well, now, you know, I mean, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised I got through college. You know what I mean? Because if you ask a guy, watch, if you ask a guy under the age of 40, what's the underlying theme that runs through your head all day? He's going to say sex, women. That's what guys think about. It's not until, you know, after 40, 45, where guys start thinking about other stuff. Like what you want. Yeah, like cutting the grass or, you know, you know what I mean? Stuff like that. Honestly, that's why they typically, they don't want a young president, right? I'm the president, I'm the most powerful man in the world. Okay, ladies, line up, right? I mean, honestly, you know? And, uh, yeah, that, it's awful being a guy. I'm ruled by that. I remember driving three hours in a blizzard on New Year's Eve. <laughs> <laughs> Going underneath those underpasses, right? It's okay, I'll make it, I'll make it, right? And then I got what I wanted, and I'm like, I got to drive three hours back. And then two days later, I'm making that same drive. That was the power of testosterone. Right? Now it's, I have to talk to you? <laughs> Wait, I have to drive someplace? Come on, cut it out. Okay, here we go. Just so you know, a lot of stars we had in the respiratory. We have Kenny from South Park. Here. Oh, yeah. Don't that look like Kenny? Okay. Anyways, a lot of stuff going on there. All right, here we go. Yeah. Right, you never know what you're going to get. All right, watch. Okay. Watch. Where's the meeting's commons area? The renal pelvis or the calyx, right? Watch. There are byproducts of metabolism that you got to get rid of. Watch. Urate, citrate, oxalate 
Tell me it ain't that great. You got that? Watch. If you get rid of calcium and you get rid of urate, oxalate, and citrate, sometimes they can combine. And they can form a kidney stone. Renal calculi. You got me? Now watch. If you have a kidney stone and it's in a kidney stone and it's in the calyx or the pelvis, it ain't going to bother you. It's when it tries to pass that it bothers you. So, and these stones, these kidney stones, are not like little peery boulders. They're like ninja death stars, right? They're jagged and, right? So when that stone tries to pass, it will lodge into the wall of the ureter. And what does the ureter try to do? It tries to contract. And each time it tries to contract, you get this wave of pain called renal colic. Tell me you got that. That is a kidney stone. Do you want a kidney stone? No, you don't. What's that? You want to go to Gateway? Bless you. Yeah, uh, parathyroid uh, tumor can cause um, uh, kidney stone formation. Diet can affect it too. Women, after they, um, uh, after pregnancy or even sometimes during pregnancy, uh, because they're taking calcium supplements, they'll uh, dump a lot of calcium into the urine. So women, um, during and after pregnancy, uh, can develop kidney stones. But isn't it less severe for us because it's not, it doesn't have as far as travel? No, it's less severe because you guys, um, our, our, your pain tolerance is higher. I, I, ab it, absolutely true. That's why men are smarter than women. Did I explain this to you? Watch. They say that when a guy gets a kidney stone, that's analogous to the pain a woman has during delivery. But when a guy gets a kidney stone, he don't want another one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got it. Thank you. Okay. Watch. What does alcohol do to urine production? Increases. So alcohol will actually stretch the ureter, right, and allow the stone to pass easier. That's why doctors will encourage you to drink beer if you have a kidney stone to get rid of it. So I drink beer and alcohol prophylactically <laughs> against kidney stone. <laughs> this guy was at the company, right, and he's like, Tim, my kidneys are killing me, they're killing me, right? And like, he was a mess, right? And then I, I said, look, you should probably go home. I can't, you know. I said, I think you got a kidney stone. Then he comes back to me, and he feels so much better. He goes, Tim, and he peed it out. You should have seen the size of that stone. I'm like, you could see the damn. I'm like, damn. That guy was my new hero. My dad had one recently, and it was huge. It was like the size I don't, yeah, you don't want those. All right. Tell, uh, tell me you're with me, you're following this. Okay, so here we go, watch. You better write this down for real. It is arterial blood that is filtered in the kidney. Why? Because it's under pressure. And as you can see, the renal artery, when it enters the kidney, it will progressively get smaller. You got me? And then the renal artery terminates, you better write this down, at the afferent arterial. And that is the beginning of the functional unit of the kidney. And the functional unit of the kidney is the nephron. That's where the rubber meets the road. The nephron is where the plasma of the blood is actually filtered. And, what's that? Can you say that one more time? The nephron is where the plasma of the blood's actually filtered. And on 
average, you have one to 1.5 million of these nephrons in each kidney. And when about 80% of those nephrons are shot in both kidneys, you're going to need dialysis. 80%? Yep, roughly. And I don't know, do you know, Samantha, do you know the, the creatinine level for dialysis? What is it? It's like four? Do you know? Doesn't matter which kind of dialysis? Um, hemodialysis or peritoneal, it shouldn't matter. At the afferent arterial, and the afferent arterial is the beginning of the nephron. Tell me you got that. All right, now watch. Write this down. Most nephrons are called cortical nephrons. They begin in the cortex of the kidney, the outer part of the kidney. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is a nephron. A student actually painted me a picture of this. So it's downstairs in my bathroom. I have a picture of a nephron. So every time I go, I'm like, hey, making me some urine. Did you guys make urine today? Guys? Who made urine today? <laughs> Anybody? What are you going to do? I'm going to make some urine. It's on the normal ranges for you. Ah, uh, that don't help. I know them. BUN is what? Wait, 15 to 20? And creatinine level is 0 0.9 to 1.2? According to this, urine level is 0, uh, 6 to 20. Okay. And creatinine is 0 0.6 to 1.3. Okay. Well, you'll figure it out. Okay, here we go. Watch, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to go through each part of the nephron and then I'm going to explain to you what happens and ultimately how you make urine. Tell me you got that. All right, watch. This is the afferent arterial. Afferent arterial. Right here, it's coming up. Dang it. Here we go. Is the afferent arterial under pressure? Yes, and one of the things that determines a, uh, afferent arterial pressure is systolic blood pressure. And the afferent arterial leads into a ball of capillaries called what? The glomerulus. And glomerulus literally means ball of capillaries. Now watch. Where is it? Whoops. How come that's turned around? That's really weird. Okay, here we go. Just wait. Okay, watch. I'm going to show you a simplified version here. So here you got the afferent arterial. And then you have the glomerulus. The glomerulus actually has little slits in it called fenestrations. So it's actually more porous than a normal capillary bed. So as the blood comes through the afferent arterial under pressure, that pressure causes the plasma of the blood to be filtered out of the glomerulus. Whatever is not filtered by the glomerulus then leaves the glomerulus through the efferent arterial. So the efferent glomerulus and afferent arterial are continuous. So efferent. And this is important. The efferent arterial then forms a network of capillaries that surround the collecting tubules. That network of capillaries that surround the collecting tubules are called the paratubular capillaries. And it is this capillary network that will reabsorb stuff that was filtered by the glomerulus and caught by the collecting tubules as it travels through the yellow brick road. Follow it. Follow the yellow brick road. You got me? 
All right, so watch. Let me just show you this real quick. If you look, if you look here, you're going to see a couple of things. Number one, you're going to note that the afferent arterial has a larger diameter than the efferent arterial. So what that means is more blood will come into the glomerulus and less blood will leave because the diameter is smaller and that will create a pressure in the glomerulus. And that pressure is filtration pressure, glomerular filtration pressure. And that's what actually filters the plasma of the blood. Now, there's big stuff in your blood. What's big in your blood? White blood cells, albumin, I heard. What else? Red blood cells. So those are too big. White blood cells, red blood cells, albumin, to get through the glomerulus. So they should never be found in your urine. That's why when you dip urine and you check it one of the things you check it for are white blood cells red blood cells and albumin and if it's found in them then there's something going on with you and those because they're not filtered they are remain in the glomerulus leave the glomerulus through the efferent arterial and then remain in the blood what was filtered by the glomerulus is caught by a little capsule that surrounds the glomerulus. And that little capsule is called Bowman's capsule or glomerular capsule. So the glomerular capsule or Bowman's capsule captures the filtrate from the glomerulus. Who's with me? Now, the efferent arterial is going to leave the glomerulus. So it goes and it, afferent to the glomerulus, then it's um, efferent. Filtered it's, it's filtered by the glomerulus, yeah. and then what's not filtered leaves the glomerulus through the efferent arterial. Okay, so it's not filtered. You got me? Guys, how many, uh, how many people are with me so far? What's the capsule called? Bowman's, Bowman's capsule, right? And that collects the filtrate from the glomerulus. Now, I'm just going to uh, give you a, just a, a, a real quick overview of this, and then um, I'll go into more detail. All right, now watch. What was filtered by the glomerulus is caught by Bowman's capsule and then enters the first part of the collecting tubules. So these little dots represent the solute. Are you with me? Now, as you can see, the efferent arterial then forms a network of capillaries that surround the collecting tubules. Yes? And these are the paratubular capillaries. Now watch, what did I tell you when you clean a closet? You, f you take out all the stuff, then you decide what you want to put back into the closet. So all the plasma gets filtered, and then as it travels through the yellow brick road, stuff will actively get reabsorbed back into the blood based on the body's needs. Who, who, who's following this? Now, in the proximal convoluted tubules, you need to write this down, 70% of the stuff that was filtered by the glomerulus gets reabsorbed back into the blood. That means the glucose that was filtered, the amino acids that were filtered, the fatty acids that were filtered, right? The vitamins that were filtered, right? The electrolytes that were filtered. All of that gets reabsorbed back into the blood. Who's with me? Right, now that makes sense, right? If you're gonna clean a closet, you know you're gonna put your skis back into the closet, you're not gonna put them in the attic in your garage. You got me? So that makes sense. Now, watch. After that filtrate 
goes through the proximal convoluted tubules, as you can see, it thins out and forms a loop. This loop is called the loop of Don Henley. Don Henley discovered it. He was on stage singing a song, and he was like, hey, I bet you there's a loop in my kidney. So it's called the loop of Don Henley. It's really not Don Henley, just so you know. I had a student who sat right there like six years ago. And she was say, taking forever to write out the test. I go, what's wrong? I, she goes, I can't remember the guy's first name. The loop of Henley serves a couple of purposes. Its biggest purpose is to concentrate urine. In times of low water intake, the loop of Henley can actually concentrate urine so it can reabsorb maximum amounts of water. This is very important. In the descending limb, remember cortex medulla, in the descending limb, the only thing that can get reabsorbed back into the blood is water. Then in the ascending limb, of the loop of Don Henley. The only thing that can get reabsorbed is solute, stuff, electrolytes. Water is impermeable in the ascending limb. Very important. Then you can see there is what I like to refer to is how I like my women, the thickened portion. <laughs> I'm just kidding. The thickened portion of the ascending limb. The thickened portion of the ascending limb is where electrolytes are actively pumped. Back into the blood. Have you ever heard of a drug called Lasix? It's called a loop diuretic because Lasix affects the thickened portion of the ascending limb. Can I show you how it works just real quick? Watch. Write this down. This will, there will be a question. This question is going to be on the test. Write it down. Are you ready? Are you going to write it down? The more stuff, the more stuff, the more solute in the urine, the more urine you make. What did I just say? Boom, here we go. Remember the law of electro neutrality? How could you forget? I mean, really, how could you forget? Love that law. Watch. There is a protein transport system in the thickened portion of the ascending limb, and it transports sodium, potassium, and two chlorides. Now watch. Sodium has a positive charge. Potassium has a positive charge. So that's two positive charges. And in order to maintain the law of electron neutrality, you have to have two negative charges. Tell me you're with me so far. And when you bring that stuff back into the blood, water's going to follow it. Tell me you got that. So if you reabsorb sodium, potassium, and two chlorides, what's going to happen to the amount of urine that you make? If you reabsorb that stuff back into the blood, it's going to go down. Now, for some people with congestive heart failure, they don't want a lot of blood volume. They don't want a lot of preload, right? So they give them a drug called Lasix. Now, this is important. Watch. In order to reabsorb sodium and potassium, you have to reabsorb two chlorides. If you don't reabsorb all of these, 
you reabsorb none of these. Tell me you got that. It, they're a package deal. It's a, called a symporter, meaning if one's not reabsorbed, none of them get reabsorbed. So watch. When you take a drug called Lasix, Lasix prevents, prevents chloride from being reabsorbed. And if you don't reabsorb chloride, what don't you reabsorb along with it? sodium and potassium and also two chlorides so what happens to the amount of stuff in your urine it goes up and what did I just tell you read what I just told you the more stuff the more urine so what are you gonna pee out sodium potassium and chloride can you find salt in anything? You can find salt in everything. Can you find potassium in everything? What's the blood level of potassium? That's very good. That's pretty narrow. So when you give them Lasix, you're peeing out a lot of potassium. So you are checking that potassium routinely. The education continues. You know who will explain that to you? No. Nobody. I don't want to talk about that. Now watch. There's a video. There's a video called diuretics and how they affect the kidney. You want to learn something? You watch that video. It is that's just it's rock star caliber, man. I mean, if I had some hair, I'd grow it long, a mullet, and I'd be a freaking rock star. Tell me you got that. All right, now watch. Normally, normally, what's the only thing that can re be reabsorbed in the thickened portion? Is stuff. Tell me you got that. So if you reabsorb stuff, the osmolarity in that thickened portion becomes very, very low. So where's the nephron? Hang on. And I'm just going to do this, and then you can ambulate home. So the... You're just reabsorbing stuff in the thickened portion. Guys, that stuff's going to get reabsorbed. So now the amount of stuff goes down, but the water stays the same. So here, in the distal convoluted tubules, you better get this. In the distal convoluted tubules, a decision is made. Am I going to make a dilute urine today, or am I going to make a concentrated urine? In the distal convoluted tubules, this is where son of a, this is where hormones take over. I quit. I absolutely quit. Got it? Boom. This is where ADH, aldosterone. and AMP have their effect. And write this down. I'm not kidding. Write it down. This will be a question too. See how nice I am? In the absence of hormones, you always make a dilute urine. In the absence of hormones, you always make a dilute urine. Have you ever heard of a condition called diabetes insipidus? Have you ever heard of it? Yeah. That's where these people have no ADH. ADH reabsorbs water back into the blood. If you don't have ADH, what kind of urine are you going to make? A dilute urine, antidiuretic. What does a diuretic make you do? Pee. Pee. If what do you think antidiuretic would make you do? Not pee. So it reabsorbs water. So if you don't have any antidiuretic hormone, you are going to be peeing all the time. Tell me you got that. If you don't have aldosterone, what are you going to be doing? Peeing all the time. 
Do you want to pee all the time? No. What do you want to do? You want to go to Gateway. All right. Good. So you went to Gateway. All right. Ambulate Home will finish up. No, that's too late. I've already turned it off. Okay, go ahead.